Britain's royal palaces. Majestic. It's absolutely dripping in history. Luxurious. The white drawing room at Buckingham Palace is like a scene from a Disney film. And packed to the rafters with incredible secrets. Secrets that the royal family would much prefer not to be made public. From royal courtships to royal births to royal marriages and scandals, the palaces have played host to all of that. This series goes behind palace walls. The royal palaces represent the monarchy and have incredible history. We'll learn how these iconic creations were built. 16th century kings built with brick in a way that we wouldn't recognize today. This is George IV leaving his mark on the center of London. Uncover the spectacular palace art housed within. The royal collection is vast, and I mean vast. It has more than a million objects spread across all of the royal palaces. Just imagine what has been collected over centuries. So this collection is unlike any other collection in the world. Discover their gruesome stories. It's an amazing insight into the royal's history, but also our common history. Frankly, if you're going to cut that off a king, it's got to be done in a palace and relive the recent events that shaped the modern royal family. The whole case was an absolute fiasco and a huge embarrassment. The Queen was particularly aggrieved that Harry had done it in the way that he had. This is The Secrets of the Royal Palaces. This time, we reveal the troubles behind the tribute to one of Kensington Palace's most famous residents. The sculptor has to please every single one of Princess Diana's billions of fans, but also two royal princes who are very used to having things done their own way. The epic story behind Windsor Castle's origins as we uncover its ancient kitchen secrets. The food that was made there has fed all kinds of illustrious figures from history. We discover hidden treasures inside a palace within a palace. I mean, this dollhouse, you actually wish that you were miniature so you could go live in it. Explore the mysteries of the strange Balmoral Pyramid. We don't really know who made it, where the materials came from. It just seems to have appeared. And reveal the shocking measures taken to protect the queen in palace isolation. If you break this 16th century lockdown, you will be killed on the gallows. The United Kingdom's royal palaces have a unique power to capture the imagination. Palaces are places where big events of state, big moments in our nation's history happen. And I suppose we've all grown up with this idea of castles and fairy tales and palaces, and you want to see inside the palace walls. So when you actually do get to go inside, it's really... Kensington Palace and Holyrood. The buildings themselves are amazing. There's no other country which has this incredible catalogue of its history, of this astonishing institution. One royal residence alone attracts 1.65 million visitors a year. The granddaddy of them all, Windsor Castle. While it may not be called a palace, for over 900 years this fortress has been a home from home to Britain's royalty. Windsor Castle is the largest occupied castle on the planet. I think it's just the most astonishing physical edifice, the way it sits in the landscape, the way it rises up the hill. This vast royal home comprises 951 rooms, including 225 bedrooms, and covers some 13 acres. And its look is straight out of a picture book. It's like when you grow up and you dream of castles, you can't help but think of Windsor Castle. Windsor's fairy tale look is thanks to a monarch obsessed with myths and legends. Edward III, who came to the throne in 1327. Edward modelled himself on the once and future King Arthur. We know him as a myth, but to those in the Middle Ages, he was very real. Basically, everyone thought that Windsor had been anciently founded by King Arthur, and Edward tried to capitalise on that by making it the centre of knightlyhood, of chivalry. But Windsor castle had been neglected by the previous reign and was no Camelot. What Edward III inherited was partly burned out, it was uh, partly in decaying, and it was badly planned. Edward set about transforming Windsor into a palace fortress on a monumental scale. But finding a workforce to build it wouldn't be easy. England was emerging from the grip of the bubonic plague. The Black Death wreaks havoc. It wipes out a third 
British population, a third. Let's just bear that in mind, what that actually means. It means it's extraordinarily hard on a practical level for the king to get workers to Windsor. And so he sends out sheriffs to round up talented masons and carpenters, all to come back to Windsor to work on making his castle bigger and better. From 1359, a chronicler says that almost all of the carpenters and masons in England were working on this site. He spent £44,000 creating the basis of a revolutionary palace which had an enormous facade uniting a hall and chapel into something altogether more monumental than had gone before. By 1365, the building works were complete, standing tall at a cost of 22. By the end of his reign, he transformed Windsor into a new type of, of palace. It was no longer merely a castle with lodgings. It was a palace. And the upper ward had become part of a super fortress with a monumental palace at the heart of it. Every subsequent monarch has some relationship back to Windsor. It is that story of continuity after Edward III's rebuilding which makes it so remarkable. Britain's royal palaces. Majestic. It's absolutely dripping in history. Luxurious. The white drawing room at Buckingham Palace is like a scene from a Disney film. And packed to the rafters with incredible secrets. Secrets that the royal family would much prefer not to be made public. From royal courtships to royal births to royal marriages and scandals, the palaces have played host to all of that. This series goes behind palace walls. The royal palaces represent the monarchy and have incredible history. We'll learn how these iconic creations were built. 16th century kings built with brick in a way that we wouldn't recognize today. This is George IV leaving his mark on the center of London. Uncover the spectacular palace art housed within. The royal collection is vast, and I mean vast. It has more than a million objects spread across all of the royal palaces. Just imagine what has been collected over centuries. So this collection is unlike any other collection in the world. Discover their gruesome stories. It's an amazing insight into the royal's history, but also our common history. Frankly, if you're going to cut the head off a king, it's got to be done in a palace and relive the recent events that shaped the modern royal family. The whole case was an absolute fiasco and a huge embarrassment. The Queen was particularly aggrieved that Harry had done it in the way that he had. This is The Secrets of the Royal Palaces. This time, we reveal the troubles behind the tribute to one of Kensington Palace's most famous residents. The sculptor has to please every single one of Princess Diana's billions of fans, but also two royal princes who are very used to having things done their own way. The epic story behind Windsor Castle's origins as we uncover its ancient kitchen secrets. The food that was made there has fed all kinds of illustrious figures from history. We discover hidden treasures inside a palace, within a palace. I mean, this dollhouse, you actually wish that you were miniature so you could go live in it. Explore the mysteries of the strange Balmoral Pyramid. We don't really know who made it, where the materials came from. It just seems to have appeared. And reveal the shocking measures taken to protect a queen in palace isolation. If you break this 16th century lockdown, you will be killed on the gallows. The United Kingdom's royal palaces have a unique power to capture the imagination. Palaces are places where big events of state, big moments in our nation's history happen. And I suppose we've all grown up with this idea of castles and fairy tales and palaces, and you want to see inside the palace walls. So when you actually do get to go inside, it's really... Kensington Palace and Holyrood. The buildings themselves are amazing. There's no other country which has this incredible catalogue of its history, of this astonishing institution. One royal residence alone attracts 1.65 million visitors a year. The granddaddy of them all, Windsor Castle. While it may not be called a palace, for over 900 years, this fortress has been a home from home to Britain's royalty. Windsor Castle is the largest occupied castle on the planet. I think it's just the most astonishing physical edifice, the way it sits in the landscape, the way it rises up the hill. 
This vast royal home comprises 951 rooms, including 225 bedrooms, and covers some 13 acres. And its look is straight out of a picture book. It's like when you grow up and you dream of castles, you can't help but think of Windsor Castle. Windsor's fairy tale look is thanks to a monarch obsessed with myths and legends, Edward III, who came to the throne in 1327. Edward modeled himself on the once and future King Arthur. We know him as a myth, but to those in the Middle Ages, he was very real. Basically, everyone thought that Windsor had been anciently founded by King Arthur, and Edward tried to capitalize on that by making it the center of knightlyhood, of chivalry. But Windsor Castle had been neglected by the previous reign and was no Camelot. What Edward III inherited was partly burned out, it was uh, partly in decaying, and it was badly planned. Edward set about transforming Windsor into a palace fortress on a monumental scale. But finding a workforce to build it wouldn't be easy. England was emerging from the grip of the bubonic plague. The Black Death wreaks havoc. It wipes out a third of the British population. A third. Let's just bear that in mind, what that actually means. It means it's extraordinarily hard on a practical level for the king to get workers to Windsor. And so he sends out sheriffs to round up talented masons and carpenters, all to come back to Windsor to work on making his castle bigger and better. From 1359, a chronicler says that almost all of the carpenters and masons in England were working on this site. He spent £44,000 creating the basis of a revolutionary palace which had an enormous facade uniting a hall and chapel into something altogether more monumental than had gone before. By 1365, the building works were complete, standing tall at a cost of 22. By the end of his reign, he transformed Windsor into a new type of, of palace. It was no longer merely a castle with lodgings. It was a palace, and the upper ward had become part of a super fortress with a monumental palace at the heart of it. Every subsequent monarch has some relationship back to Windsor. It is that story of continuity after Edward III's rebuilding which makes it so remarkable. Windsor, the oldest and largest inhabited castle in the world, is still home to around 150 people. Another palace, Kensington, accommodates so many royals both major and minor, that its family nickname is the Aunt Heap. One of Kensington's most famous and best-loved residents could soon be immortalized here. In 2017, the historic sunken garden at Kensington Palace was transformed into the White Flower Garden in celebration of the life of Princess Diana. We know that Diana was a huge fan of the gardens at Kensington Palace and would stop by after her morning jog to speak to the Gardeners, particularly in the sunken garden. For Princes William and Harry, it's a special place too. Well, William and Harry have got bittersweet memories of Kensington Palace. They loved living there with Princess Diana. She really made an effort into making it a home. And it was incredibly touching to see that Harry and Meghan chose to announce their engagement in that exact spot, a nod to Diana and her being part of their celebration. 20 years after her death sparked national mourning, of flowers outside Kensington Palace, William and Harry commissioned a statue of Diana to cement her legacy, an honour almost exclusively reserved for kings and queens. At Kensington Palace, there's a lovely statue of Queen Victoria in her coronation robes, but amazingly enough, it's made in marble by Queen Victoria's daughter, Princess Louise. So if Diana does emerge there as a statue, she'll be in very distinguished company. Creating a fit tribute to Princess Diana can be tricky to get right, as previous attempts demonstrate. There are some very, very bad Diana statues out there. They haven't really captured Princess Diana as I think the family would want her to be captured. Whether they're made from marble or marzipan, from the sublime to the ridiculous. There's a whole army of Diana statues in China. And who can forget the incredibly tasteless half-naked one that used to be in Harry at the bottom of the stairs, barefoot with her and Dodie fired, both releasing a bird into 
who knows what. Trusted not to add to this list, renowned sculptor Ian Rank Broadley was given the commission. Because his design of the Queen adorned every British coin. So he is aware of how to tread the line between an authentic, genuine representation of someone and perhaps slightly flattering a royal ego or two. He's renowned for making very lifelike effigies of people, often naked, but that probably wouldn't be happening in Diana's case. It's a difficult commission because I think she's a very, very hard person to capture in a sculpture. She was so vivid. The sculptor has to please not only every single one of Princess Diana's billions of fans, but also two royal princes who are very used to having things done their own way. All this may go some way to explaining why the statue has yet materialised. Now it's three years since the boys commissioned this statue. One wonders what is going on. We don't know whether the delay on the statue is, is it funding? Have there been second thoughts? Do the brothers disagree about the design? And is this further evidence of the fractious relationship between the two of them? The latest news is the statue might finally be unveiled in time to mark what would have been Diana's 60th birthday in 2021. She was arguably one of the most famous people ever to live at Kensington Palace, so I think it makes complete sense that you would honour her with a statue in the place that was her home. Coming up in Secrets of the Royal Palaces, palace doctors only make things worse for one unfortunate queen. She's sick, she's being treated with hot irons on the forehead, her feet are being baked, it's utterly torturous. And inside the infamous Sandringham Summit, what really happened? They wanted to keep it as private as possible, they didn't want anything being leaked to the press. Britain's famous royal palaces, from Buckingham Palace to Holyrood, are homes, workplaces and living monuments. The royal palaces really help represent the monarchy and the stability and longevity. You have centuries of tradition, priceless artefacts, and I think we're very lucky to have them. Windsor Castle has been home to 40 monarchs, and has stood for almost a thousand years. In 1992, a devastating fire broke out, burning for 15 hours and tearing through 115 rooms. Out of the ashes came extraordinary architectural discoveries. In the great kitchen, a 19th century plaster and wood ceiling went up in the archaeologists moved in and used dendrochronology, the science of dating timbers by their tree rings for the years of growth. They revealed something quite extraordinary, that this, in fact, was mostly original to Edward III's building. It had been there for 650 years, and all of the thousands of meals that had been prepared from then until now had been spanned by this astonishing structure. As the kitchen was restored, this medieval wooden roof was allowed to shine through. It's so impressive as a piece of engineering. It had to span a building 80 feet long by 26 feet wide, the equivalent of a great hall in most major medieval houses. It's a very innovative type of construction which allowed the central section to be lifted to let light in and smoke out. This discovery makes this one of the oldest working kitchens in the world quite amazing that centuries and centuries of cooking have taken place there and of course the food that was made there um, has fed all kinds of great illustrious figures uh, from history. The kitchens in a castle in a royal palace are the beating heart of that palace. The kitchen itself measures over 2,000 square feet and throughout history, it's been surrounded by a warren of larders. The Great Kitchen was supported by the early 16th century up to around uh, 19 kitchen offices. And these included things like the spicery, where you knew where things like cloves were and saffron and uh, cinnamon, if you could get it. And there were words strange to us today, like akatri, which is a place where you store hunted goods, where you'd hang birds rabbits, for example. All of these had to have different conditions for their storage and preparation, but they had to combine 
in such a way that the kitchen was a well-oiled engine for the delivery of food. Today's kitchen reveals snippets of its long history, from its medieval roof to the copper pots dating back to the reign of George IV 200 years ago. And as it has done throughout history, it is still preparing banquets to be served in the nearby St George's Hall. I don't think we can underestimate just how incredible, really, it is to know that these kitchens, which are still so relevant today, this idea of the royal family evolving with us and that journey through food uh, being witnessed over a, a, a period of centuries. So it's staggering stuff. The Windsor Castle kitchens catered for the fairy tale wedding of Harry and Meghan, serving seasonal British food to 600 guests. The honeymoon, though, did not last long before rumours Sandringham was the venue for talks that would decide the future of the monarchy. Christmas at Sandringham, the Queen's winter residence, is a royal tradition. But in 2019, Harry and Meghan spent the holidays abroad. If you received an invitation from the Queen to come for Christmas, you just don't turn it down. It's accepted that, of course, you will go. All of these rumblings of discontent in the press suddenly seem to be given some credence by the fact that the couple weren't there for Christmas. Two weeks later, Harry and Meghan released a statement that shocked the family and the world. They were to step back from their royal duties. They basically held a gun to the Queen's head. It really did threaten the very fabric of the monarchy. This was an extraordinary move, unprecedented in the Queen's reign. We very rarely get an insight into the Queen's personal feelings about anything, and yet there were briefings explaining that the Queen felt hurt um, and upset. They wanted to try and present a united front, and that united front was crumbling faster than the Berlin Wall. The Queen summoned the family. The Sandringham Summit was set for the 13th of January. The world's press assembled. The Queen is known for being a cool and a calm head in a crisis. And I think certainly by holding the meeting at Sandringham, it was very much on her terms. The Sandringham Summit was the Queen acting as grandmother, first of all, and Queen second, I think, trying to bang their heads together and sort it out. There was a notable absentee. One person who wasn't in the room was Prince Philip, with a lot of people suggesting that he wasn't there because he was so angry that Harry had threatened the fabric of the family. He saw it as a dereliction of duty. Harry was a favourite of his. They, they had a very deep bond between them. He had taken Harry under his wing after Diana had been killed. Meghan was also conspicuous in her absence. She was in Canada and she to dial in. But then certain aides started saying that there may have been a problem with the Wi-Fi in that particular room, which sounded like the perfect excuse for her not being on the call. Apparently, she did speak to Harry several times during the day, but she didn't take direct part in, in the meeting. The Queen wanted absolute privacy and chose the secluded Long Library, the location of her first televised Christmas address. Only a handful of key left right-hand men and women. In fact, Harry had two private secretaries with him. Household staff, though, were banished. The Queen apparently instructed all of her staff to kind of keep to the other side of the house. They wanted to keep it as private as possible. They didn't want anything being leaked to the press. The summit was scheduled for 2 p.m., in between two other key events, lunch and afternoon tea. The Queen was acutely aware that tensions were running high. The Queen always pauses for tea at five o'clock, and I think it was probably quite a clever way of making sure that the meeting couldn't actually run over. Nothing stops the Queen from taking tea and her cucumber sandwiches. At last, the stage was set for talks to begin. I think the atmosphere was really quite tense. There had been a lot of discord, frayed tempers, high emotions. The Queen acted as proverbial maker really. William and Harry weren't speaking to each other. Well, they, they had to that day. 
she really was trying to find a way of accommodating what Meghan and Harry wanted. Harry said, well, we want to move to North America, but we want to keep all our charities and patronages and everything going here. And the Queen's senior advisers said, no, you can't have one foot in the royal family and one foot outside the royal family. That is not going to work. You have to decide. And so with some regret, Harry said, well, OK, we'll, we'll go then. This was Harry relinquishing his title, his military appointments, quitting the royal family for an independent life. For Harry, it was a bit of a shock because he discovered that it wasn't all going to be on his terms. After only 90 minutes, the summit was over, just in time for tea. And the royal family was forever changed. I know that the Queen was very saddened by the fact that they wanted out and they, they couldn't make it work to remain within the family. I'm sure William was devastated because he was saying goodbye to his brother, you know, his pal. It must have been utterly devastating. But Harry, I guess, had to do what he had to do. The Sandringham Summit was probably one of the most important meetings to have happened in the royal family. In many ways, Prince Harry was setting a precedent for the next generation of royals. If this works, then it may well be a blueprint for Princess Charlotte and Prince Louis and other royal children down the line of succession. In her 68 year tribulations at her palaces, some monarchs, though, have faced altogether more treacherous and deadly threats within them. Kensington Palace, beloved royal home since 1689, hides a guilty secret. The shocking ill treatment of one of history's unluckiest monarchs. Queen Anne was the last of the Stuart monarchs, and she had a very hard life due to her health. But it was at Kensington Palace where she suffered the greatest at the hands of the doctors who were meant to make her better. Queen Anne suffered from obesity and gout and was often unkindly described as homely by the court. Her husband, George, Prince of Denmark, was rather drunk, a bit of a bore, but he was quite a good husband. But the problem was that they simply couldn't have a child between them. She was pregnant at least 17 times and had many miscarriages, many stillbirths, many children who lived only a few hours after birth. Had Anne had one living child, I think she'd have gone down as a successful queen who was tormented by bad health. On the morning of 30th of July, 1714, Anne was taken very ill. Her doctors say that her gout has traveled up from her leg, up into her nerves and into her brain. So they get these hot irons and they put these hot irons on her forehead and they get these hot cups and they put them on the thigh to try and get rid of the gout. And they give her this really disgusting concoction to try and make her sick. It's utterly torturous and she drifted off into death with no help from these doctors who should have been keeping her comfortable, looking after her. And one of her doctors, Dr. John Arbuthnot, said that he thought that no weary traveler could have wanted to rest more than she could because she was simply exhausted by all her ill health. Coming up on Secrets of the Royal Palaces, we reveal the luxuries inside the world's tiniest palace. There are bottles of wine and champagne that are actually filled with real wine and champagne. So just in terms of the miniature wine collection, it's probably worth a fortune. And the incredible story behind grieving Queen Victoria's monument to her lost love. To put the whole of Albert in gold was very extravagant and somewhat controversial. Today,
palaces are more open and accessible than ever, allowing us a glimpse behind the gilded curtain. And every artifact tells a story. There are more than a million pieces in the Royal Collection. It's the largest private art collection in the world. It, it encapsulates the history of our nation and of the monarchy. And every sculpture, every vase is precious and priceless. In Windsor Castle's collection, there's a perfect snapshot of royal life a hundred years ago. Queen Mary's Doll's House. This is one of the most popular, best-loved objects in the whole of the Royal Collection. It's a doll's house version of a palace. And that might sound like something for a child to play with, but this is absolutely not a toy. Built in the 1920s, the doll's house was an inspired present from the king cousin, Princess Mary Louise, to his wife Mary. Queen Mary really enjoyed miniatures. She loved having these teeny tiny objects that were replicated from real items, but on a small scale. Showcasing contributions from 1,500 of the finest craftsmen and manufacturers of the day, this was not your average doll's house. When it's closed, it's already quite a big object. It's five feet tall. But open it up it's completely astonishing you almost don't know where to look first there are more than 20 rooms instead of opening up from the front like a traditional doll's house does the whole cellars a garage a vault kitchens it's simply the most spectacular doll's house anywhere in the world even more surprising there's a drawer underneath that slides out with a perfect garden inside. Each room of this idealised palace is a treasure trove. Real objects from Windsor Castle were painstakingly replicated at a 1 to 12 scale, including more than 700 paintings. Artists were sending in copies of paintings they knew were in the Royal Collection, but they're done on a 1 12th scale, with all the skill you see in the original. Real jewellery makers and goldsmiths were actually employed to make this miniature version of the crown jewels. The library would be the envy of any book lover. There are over 500 miniature books in the library. And these include everything from the complete works of Shakespeare to the Bible. From chandeliers and intricate woven carpets to vinyl records to doors. No detail was too small. The tiny palace boasted luxury facilities the average Brit could only dream of in their own home. And they really worked. Electricity was installed throughout the house, controlled by minuscule little light switches. There was even a working lift, and there were taps that had proper hot and cold running water. Astonishingly, even the cellar was the real deal, stocked with over hundred mini bottles. There are bottles of wine and champagne that are actually filled with real wine and champagne. They were selected according to vintage. So just in terms of the miniature wine collection, it's probably worth a fortune. All of the pieces that we know of today are still working and it's carefully cared for at Windsor Castle, where it remains on display today. I mean, this dollhouse, you actually wish that you were miniature so you could go live in it. Being safely tucked away inside a real-life palace, like Windsor Castle, is certainly appealing. Even more so in times of crisis. And when mortal danger threatens, the royals pull up the proverbial drawbridge. March 2020. As a deadly infectious disease swept the country, it was announced the Queen would self-isolate inside Windsor Castle a move that echoed her namesake, Elizabeth I, who was forced to do the same some 470 years earlier. Ebonic plague in England. It's been circulating around Europe, but this is a particularly virulent and cruel strain. Elizabeth has only just recovered from smallpox, and now there's a possibility that she could die of plague. It's a brutal, miserable death. London is seen as the eye of the storm. Elizabeth has all these lovely palaces, like Greenwich, 
or places like Richmond and Hampton Court, she decides none of those are far enough from the plague. Elizabeth flees to Windsor Castle and every attempt is made to protect her there. They set up a gallows in Windsor. And that gallows is for any Londoner who tries to flee from London and go to Windsor because they are thought to be carrying the plague. There's no breaking the 16th century lockdown. And if you break this 16th century lockdown, you will be killed on the gallows. And this actually works well. Elizabeth doesn't catch the plague. She is protected. And when the plague itself has subsided and many, many people have died, she can emerge and be queen once more. One famous monarch who lived and entertained at Windsor Castle was Queen Victoria. In 1861, her beloved Prince Albert died here and was buried in a specially built mausoleum. It was not Victoria's only memorial to him. A stone's throw from Kensington Palace, Victoria's childhood home, is a gleaming golden giant. It's very bright and golden and slightly gaudy. A monument to Victoria's love for her lost husband. The Albert Memorial is Britain's Taj Mahal. In the autumn of 1861, Prince Albert was diagnosed with typhoid and he died just a few days later. He was only 42 and, of course, Victoria was completely devastated. Thoughts soon turned to providing a suitable tribute for Albert. Apparently, Prince Albert left instructions that there should be no memorials to him whatsoever. So Queen Victoria obviously ignored that. This memorial would be far from humble. The Queen gave the commission to star architect of the day, George Gilbert Scott. George Gilbert Scott was a pioneer of the neo-Gothic movement. It was a really radical period of architecture and art, looking to the medieval past, to vaults and arches, and those sorts of colors and sensations that you get inside a great cathedral. And his vision for Albert's memorial spared no expense. His plan was to build a sort of, and it would have these enormous granite steps leading up to a massive oversized sculpture of Prince Albert. This vision did not come cheap, and a major chunk of Scott's budget went on some serious bling. With all the sculptures, you might see gold gilding used on the face, but to put the whole of Albert in gold, to have him completely gilded, was very extravagant and somewhat controversial, but Victoria loved it. Everything about the memorial coming together was supposed to show Albert as cultured, as visionary. He sat there holding the plans to the 1851 Great Exhibition, which he himself helped to organise and put together. The memorial would be surrounded by imposing sculptures, celebrating his passion for the British Industrial Age and the rapid expansion of empire. On each corner, you have the four continents. You have Asia, Europe, America, Africa. Then you have monuments to, really, the things that Britain were founded upon. Manufacturing, commerce, agriculture, and engineering. One of the most interesting things, I think, about the memorial is actually what lies underneath. There are 868 brick arches, which look like a sort of catacomb in a honeycomb shape. It's a complete feat of engineering, and it supports uh, this enormous set of granite steps above. The Albert Memorial took 10 years to complete and was finally unveiled in 1872. Coming in at the eye-popping cost of £120,000, around £14 million today, paid for by the government and public fundraising. It's a really hugely ambitious memorial. It's about a vision outwards and forwards. But I love the fact that it's also, on another level, a really intimate gesture of the deep love and the lovesickness of Victoria after Albert's death. Still to come on Secrets of the Royal Palaces, the other Albert Memorial, we discover the mysterious Balmoral Pyramid. It is really not what you would expect to see in the middle of the Scottish Highlands. And we reveal the secret structures of the chapel at Windsor Castle. 
There are no mistakes in this building. There's absolute refinement in the way that the bases of the columns produce shafts that rise through the architecture, around the vaults, and then back again. Kensington Gardens, once the private gardens of Kensington Palace, housed the Albert Memorial, Queen Victoria's most lavish tribute to her late husband. 500 miles away, in the grounds of Balmoral Castle, Victoria commissioned an altogether more private and mysterious monument. It was like being immersed in a different world going up to Scotland. This was their patch where they could do things how they liked. Hidden beneath these trees lies something more at home in Egypt than the Highlands. A stone pyramid, so strange and so puzzling, it still raises questions today. The mystery of the Balmoral Pyramid actually runs even deeper. We don't really know who made it, where the materials came from, when it was constructed exactly. It just seems to have appeared. It's a pyramid of rough hewn stone built into the ground. It's completely unembellished. It looks ancient and it has a kind of solemnity, quietness about it. Totally different from the Albert Memorial in Kensington Gardens. The pyramid was built from granite in 1862, but other details are shrouded in mystery. We still don't know who built it or how. The inscription reads his broken-hearted widow, Victoria R, 21st of August, 1862. I think Albert would have loved the Balmoral Memorial, probably more than the Albert Memorial in London, because it's truer to this sense of his curiosity across time. The Balmoral Pyramid is apparently inspired by traditional cairns. Interestingly, this cairn isn't the only one on the estate at Balmoral. Cairns have been used to mark burial sites in Scotland since prehistoric times. Cairns have an ancient history. It's the idea of piling up stones one upon the other as a lasting memorial, and they have a particularly strong presence in Scotland. Victoria knew this. But Albert's cairn is one of a kind. The thing that's different about the Albert one is it is very smooth. Its simplicity and its symbolism are so powerful. I, I think just the fact that they're located away from everybody as a place where Victoria could privately remember her husband too. There's something very powerful about that. Victoria's preoccupation with the afterlife was not unusual. Religion and monarchy are inextricably linked. A royal chapel is as important to any palace as a banqueting hall or shiny gates. All royal chapels, though, 
were not created equal. Within the grounds of Windsor Castle stands an extraordinary building. It's the place where the royal family marks some of the most important moments in their lives. St George's Chapel, I mean, you know, it's almost a joke that it's called a chapel. It's a thumping great building. And it's the first thing you see literally when you arrive. And it's one of the most stunning spaces within all the royal palaces. This is the kind of show-stopping peak in that fortified citadel. The chapel was the brainchild of Edward IV, a Yorkist king who seized the English throne during the War of the Roses. He'd won the crown, but he realized his palaces were missing something important. Edward IV had a big problem, because where was he to be buried? Where was his family to be buried? Westminster Abbey had been the traditional resting place of English monarchs, but it was filling up. Edward set about building a new royal burial site at Windsor. He wanted a place where he could ultimately be laid to rest, but importantly, his family, his dynasty could be commemorated. Edward died in 1483, and although he never saw St George's Chapel finished, he was the first to use it. There are no mistakes in this building. There's absolute refinement in the way that the bases of the columns produce shafts, rise through the architecture, around the vaults, and then back again. It is a work of utter, utter refinement. It's heartbreaking in its, in its beauty. When the stained glass glowed and when the paint was fresh, it must have been like a boiled sweet. St George's Chapel is now the burial site of 10 monarchs. For the Queen, it's a deeply personal site. Both her parents and her sister Margaret lie at rest here. But this building is more than a mausoleum. For over 500 years, it's been a place where the nation can share in the royal family's joy. Next time, an undercover journalist infiltrates Buckingham Palace. He even served the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh their breakfast. Royal emotions run high in a family feud over Sandringham. The Queen Mother was horrified that a house that she loved might be threatened with demolition. And we uncover Windsor's own Da Vinci Code. Can you imagine the changes that might have come about had we discovered them earlier?
castle bigger and better. From 1359, a chronicler says that almost all of the carpenters and masons in England were working on this site. He spent £44,000 creating the basis of a revolutionary palace which had an enormous facade uniting a hall and chapel into something altogether more monumental than had gone before. By 1365, the building works were complete, standing tall at a cost of 22. By the end of his reign, he transformed Windsor into a new type of, of palace. It was no longer merely a castle with lodgings. It was a palace. And the upper ward had become part of a super fortress with a monumental palace at the heart of it. Every subsequent monarch has some relationship back to Windsor. It is that story of continuity after Edward III's rebuilding which makes it so remarkable.